Until 50 years ago, London was the centre of a vast shipping network with trade connections to ports right across the globe. Way back in Elizabethan times, sailors following the intrepid explorers Francis Drake and Walter Raleigh developed trade with Russia, the Americas and the East. And as a result, London became wealthy on a tide of sugar, spices and silk. As a result, London was able to become a city of international stature and a centre for finance and shipping. Prosperity helped the city to grow, not just along the river with docks and warehouses, but in the financial heart. Places like the Royal Exchange and Lloyd's of London were built thanks to wealth generated by the port. Both sides of the river were lined with warehouses holding all sorts of goods. Tobacco, alcohol and furs had to be declared to customs and the duty paid in the legal quays on the north side. All the ships waiting to be discharged stayed in the Pool of London between London Bridge and where Tower Bridge now is. But the trouble was that London was enormously successful and so ships often had to wait here for weeks until their cargo could be discharged. In fact, the place got so crowded, it said you could walk from bank to bank of the river just by jumping from ship to ship. It must have been amazing. This area may look respectable and law-abiding now, but in its day, Wapping and Ratcliffe were at the heart of a rather seedy sailor town. You can get a feel for what things would have been like down at the museum in Docklands. The streets were probably a bit like this one. Dark, narrow, twisting, smelly, lined with pubs and brothels and the sort of shops that sell things that sailors want. Food, for example, and, and chandlers with ropes, that sort of stuff. And of course they were full of thieves and vagabonds and people ready to prey on drunken and unsuspecting sailors. In fact, I think maybe I'd better scarf her before I get my wallet nicked. Just imagine dozens of ships anchored here for days, even for weeks, and laden with the most delectable goodies, an absolute magnet for rival gangs of criminals. The criminals who were caught were hanged at execution dock just along here somewhere, and then their bodies would be placed in an iron cage against the wall and left there for three tides to wash over them as a warning to others. It didn't seem to do much good, though, because in 1797, a chap called Patrick Cahoon calculated that half a million pounds worth of stuff was stolen every year. That's about, say, 40 million in today's values. So he and a group of ship owners campaigned for the construction of enclosed docks. The Thames had been overcrowded for far too long. Enclosed docks had been needed in London for around 100 years, but the various companies of porters, lightermen and watermen who carried cargoes off vessels had always blocked any proposals for enclosed docks in order to protect their livelihoods. Rival ports like Liverpool that had already modernised were way ahead of London. This is West India Dock, completed in 1802 on the open fields of the Isle of Dogs. And when it was finished, this huge warehouse was the largest brick building in the world. On this side is the northern import dock. The ships would come in here to discharge their cargo. And when they'd done that, they went through to the southern export dock over there to load up again for their next trip. The huge advance was that they didn't have to go and wait weeks and weeks in town to be checked by customs and excise. All the checks could be done here on the spot, which speeded up the whole process enormously until it wasn't long before they could get through 500 ships in the year. The dock was open solely for the trade of the West India Merchants Company, who had cannily won a 21-year monopoly on catering to all ships carrying cargoes from the West Indies. The warehouses were soon full of sugar, rum, tobacco and coffee. Dockers who carried sacks of cane sugar ended up with badly scratched and bleeding backs from the coarse sugar. Bags were washed, hung out to dry and then reused. As a result, the area became known as Blood Alley. 
Barrels played a huge role in transporting all manner of liquids, but they needed constant maintenance and repair. This was the job of the Dock Coopers. Now, John here, you're a cooper, is that yes, right? Yes, yeah. Hogsheads, tons and punchons, yeah. what are they? Pipes, all casts, they're all wooden casts. No, different sizes different of barrels. Different sizes. This is oak, yes? And then you've got iron hoops around yeah. it, which are just holes all right. staves right. together. That's right, yeah. And this is called the head? head. That's right. OK. Yeah. So, and what... Yeah. what yeah. yeah. Ammer and driver. A driver? Yeah. yeah. OK, yeah. show me what you're going to do. Okay. I'm going to stand back a bit, okay. and then in a minute I'll ask whether I can have a go, but I want to see how you do it first. Well, that was easy enough. I said, well, it's, it's dried out, the timber. Oh, I see, so. OK. So it ought to be damp, ought it? It's still a bit green well, or something. In the vaults, all the cast of wine and spirit, the atmosphere's correct. Right. So it stays lovely and cool. And right. It's, it's handsome for right. cast, you know. If you had a cask in the sun, even though if it had something in it, whiskey, it would start to drive out and leave, you'd see the staves, especially on the top, right. where it was laying down, right. where the sun's built in down. Right. Sometimes we've had uh, ships, loads of sherry come from Spain, where the cars have been out in Spain on the quay, yeah. and when they've come over, they've been as slack as anything, but when they come off the ship, litres everywhere, there's the coopers running up. <laughs> where they've been out in the sun. Out yes, of time. yes. For three yeah, or four okay. days, you know. Now, do you think I can do this one? Yeah, of course. Go, go on, on then. Yeah. So, my hammer and my driver. That's it. And go under the. That's it. Yeah. Anywhere there? Yeah, you've got it. It's not moving. Yeah. Well, come round. Oh, yes, it is moving. It's just moving yeah. a bit. Yeah, you're right ahead, yeah. on it? Hey, I did something useful. You've got well, it. <laughs> moderate, moderate useful. So, you're actually pushing the staves out a bit. To get the head out the groove. Right. So now this would all fall apart if we hadn't got the hoops on. That's right, yeah. The wood of this barrel has dried out and the staves have become quite slack. It needs maintenance, so John is tightening up the iron bands before fixing them back into place. Now, how do you show the customs man what's in it? We have to knock the bung out. How? Hang on a sec, it's jammed in there. We use a wooden flogger. A wooden flogger. Yeah. I'm standing well back. Yeah. You've got to be very careful because if you hit it a bit too hard, you, the stave could crack. But... Hey, that's amazing. And you just wallop it and it pushes yeah. the bung out. The customs men would take a sample of the liquid to verify what it was and also use special gauging instruments to measure the dimensions of the barrel. Afterwards, the barrels would be resealed a piece of sackcloth was placed over the hole before the bung was replaced to give a nice tight fit. Did you ever um, have a taste of the contents? You mean the liquid? Yeah. Well, can I say this? Liquid was one thing in the port of London was flowing. That's the perks of the job, isn't it? I don't need to say no more, need I? <laughs> you don't need to say any more indeed. Do I? Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. Cheers. Just like today, customs officers were sharp on scrutinising everything that came through the port, and they had all manner of devices for doing so. When somebody imported loose cargo in sacks like this, the customs officers would want to make sure there wasn't any contraband hidden there, say, a oh, box of tobacco or a, a bottle of brandy or something like that. So he would produce his rummage stick and he would go... <sighs> no, sorry, no brandy in there. Soon, other companies started to get in on the act and built their own docks, complete with hard bargain for monopolies. Wine and brandy came into the London docks in Wapping. Timber from Scandinavia and the Baltic was unloaded at the Surrey commercial docks near Rotherhithe, while the East India docks in Blackwall catered for the trade in tea, spices and silks. There's not a lot left of the docks, but in some places there are still high walls like these, built to keep the thieves out and the goods safely locked away. Some walls were 50 feet high. They weren't taking any chances. The West India Dock had a couple of hundred men patrolling the premises. The dock police lived close by in these rather nice cottages. 
The men were pretty well armed. They had truncheons, they had cutlasses like this, and they had blunderbusses, so they could tackle practically anyone. Hey, hey, you, come back here. Docks and warehouses were built all along both banks of the river, and there was fierce competition between the different companies. In order to get trade, they had to keep their prices down, and one result of that was that the dockers were very badly paid. It was nearly always casual work, and they had to work outside in every sort of weather. In fact, life as a docker must have been pretty tough. This is one of the dock gates, and it was just here that all the casual workers would come at 7.45 in the morning for the call-on to try and get a job, jostling, bustling for position, trying to get to the foreman's attention. At one time, there were 60,000 men working in the docks. It must have been an amazing sight. Ah, there you are. I've come here to the Royal Observatory at Greenwich to witness a rather curious thing. You see that red ball up there? It looks like a sort of lolly on a stick. But that was, in fact, the world's first accurate public timepiece, and it turned out to be absolutely vital for the shipping business. It doesn't look much like a clock, and, in fact, it tells the time only once every day. But this is how it works. At exactly five minutes to one, the red ball goes halfway up the stick. At exactly two minutes to one, it goes up to the top. And at the point of one o'clock, it comes down again. It's very, very simple. There it goes. It's on its way up to the very top, so that means it's exactly two minutes to one. It can't be long now. Very close to one o'clock. There it goes. It's exactly one o'clock. Right, my watch is a minute and a half fast. Exactly one o'clock, the ball comes tumbling down. Isn't that a wonderful time signal? What was the point of the red ball? Well, you have to imagine the Pool of London, just upriver there, absolutely packed with sailing ships at anchor, waiting to sail out into the seven seas. But they don't know exactly what time it is. So at around one o'clock, they all train their telescopes on the red ball, and when it drops, they know it's exactly one o'clock. Then they can set their ship's clocks and know exactly when the next high tide was. But in fact, knowing the time was much more important than that for navigation. Suppose you're sailing around the world, like these chaps here, then you need to know how far east or west you are. That's your longitude, because otherwise you might crash into Africa. Well, I'm in Greenwich, which is here, and that's longitude zero, and suppose it's now noon, so home time is 12 noon. For these chaps out in the middle of the Atlantic, the time's going to be about 9 o'clock in the morning. But if they know that home time is 12 noon, then they know they're three hours behind Greenwich and therefore about 3,000 miles west. And the first chap to get a grip on home time and therefore longitude was John Harrison. Oh, Jonathan, what are you doing? Hi, I'm just winding one of the Harrison timekeepers. So this is H3? This one is H3, yes. One of this uh, series of remarkable timekeepers by John Harrison, which, of course, ultimately solved the longitude problem. And this was, what, 1750? Um, this one was actually started in 1740 and finished just before 1760. It's quite complicated. Like the earlier ones, he couldn't use a pendulum, could he? Because that wouldn't work at sea. That's right. But it was these large timekeepers were based on pendulum clocks. Harrison obviously had to decide, first of all, um, where he would start with his marine timekeepers. And uh, he looked first at clocks and watches and decided which way to go. Watches at, the, at that time in the 1720s were hopelessly inaccurate things, but pendulum clocks were very accurate. So the logical thing to do was to start large. Uh, obviously, you can't take a pendulum to sea because it would just sort of crash around. So instead of a pendulum, Harrison fitted oscillating balance wheels. Um, this is in H3. In H1 and H2, they were balanced bars. They moved in antiphase, that is to say they were moving in opposite directions, and they were interlinked, which Harrison believed would make them so that they weren't affected by the motion of the ship. Right, self-compensating. Well, it wasn't strictly true, but that was his idea, and it worked to some extent. Right. Were any of these tested at sea? 
Number one was tested at sea. It was sent on an unofficial trial to Lisbon in Portugal. And on the way back, it did rather well. It actually got the ship out of trouble because they thought they were further away from the land than they were. And Harrison said, no, no, H1 tells me we're actually in a dangerous position. And the master was highly impressed by this. So right from the beginning, it began to prove its usefulness. This wasn't the ultimate, was it? Absolutely, because of course, although it was 19 years, this was not what sold it. It was H4 that did the business. This is H4, this is the ultimate, yes? This is uh, Harrison's fourth timekeeper, yes. We call it the, the Mona Lisa of watches. <laughs> it's not, not only the first practical marine chronometer, this was the first of all precision watches. So did this watch actually save lives? What it led to certainly did, because this was the precursor of the modern marine chronometer, which went on to save thousands of lives and millions of tonnes of valuable cargo, certainly. So this must be, well, the most important watch ever made. I think it, it certainly counts for that, absolutely. Harrison's invention was a hugely important breakthrough for navigation. The danger of running aground was reduced, but life at sea was still a dangerous business. It's hard to imagine, but a couple of hundred years ago, the whole river here would have been heaving with ships. And of course, every now and then, people fell off and drowned. And so they needed lifeboats. Now, the chap who really knows about lifeboats is Simon Stevens here, who's curator of... The Ship Model and Boat Collection at the National Maritime Museum. Group. OK, so you know everything. What? <laughs> when did they start thinking about lifeboats? Well, the idea came about in the late 18th century because uh, there was a huge loss of life uh, off of the coasts uh, around the UK within spitting distance of the land, and people on the land were getting so frustrated that they couldn't rescue these poor souls, so they got together to form life-saving communities or societies from which they needed life-saving or lifeboats to, to do their work. Right. Who actually invented the lifeboat? The idea of, of, of making a, a, a boat uh, sufficiently buoyant to, to be able to save life had been around since about 1785. For instance, there was a chap called Lionel Lukin, uh, who was a London coach builder by trade right. at Longacre. He actually added buoyancy cases to a, a, a boat to make it unemergible, as he called it. Now, Simon, I brought along my own lifeboat here. Yeah. Tell me about the important features of it. Right. The most important features of the lifeboat at this day are these end air cases, bow and stern. These have got to be sealed units so that the air can't rush out and it, they're full of uh, buoyant materials such as cork. Okay. okay. Now the whole idea of these end cases is that when the boat is upset it raises the boat and makes it unstable in the water. Ah. Now you'll notice here also that there's some heavy uh, metal objects inside ballast the, at ballast, the bottom. Ballast, exactly. And this would have been on the outside or the underside of the keel, so that when the boat was upturned... So if it goes up that way... It would make it completely unstable. Then it's going to be very unstable, very unstable. and it'll swing back and again. it should swing back. So it should be self-righting. You, do you predict, when I put this in the water, is it going to float? It looks to me like it will float, certainly. This is a, a, a tense moment. One, two, three... Ah! It's floating. It's floating. Now, every time a lifeboat was built, they had to do these tests. The RLN insisted that buoyancy tests were done so that the boat floated. On every boat? On every boat, and that they were self righted as well, that was self right in principle. Where did they do the tests? They did them on the Thames. Right mostly, here in the river? On the yards that built them, absolutely. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. OK, so now you're saying if I turn it over, it's going to turn itself up the right way up again? In theory, it should do, yes. OK, so now I'm going to turn her right over. Now, she's now resting on those air cases, which is lifting the whole of the hull up. Right. And the ballast is high, making the whole of the hull unstable. So you reckon she'll turn herself on the right yep. way up? Well, yes, I think it will. There you go. Ah, Look at that. That is... Bingo. That's very impressive. I'm just going to do that again to prove there was no trick, nothing up my sleeve. I'm now, going to turn it the wrong way up. OK. One, two, three, go. There we are. That's very impressive. See? So it's the combination, then, of the high-up air tanks here yep. and the heavy ballast... On the other side the, of the keel, down below. The keel. So when it's overturned, it's completely unstable. And if you imagine this in a, in a rough sea, it just wouldn't stay up uh, the wrong way for, for very long at all. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. That's My wonderful. Pleasure. At one time, up to 90% of Britain's lifeboats were made in London's stockyards. And to this day, all lifeboats have to follow this self-writing principle. As vessels got bigger and steamships slowly took over, the old upriver docks were too small and trade moved further downstream. There's not a lot left of the old docks now. However, there is one company that is still bringing in cargo up the Thames. Here on the marshes of East London, in the late 1800s, two sugar refineries were opened. One by a grocer called Henry Tate, 
and the other by a cooper and ship owner called Abram Lyle. By 1921, the two companies had merged to form Tate and Lyle, and they're still here at Silvertown. What's more, they still bring in the raw sugar by ship up the Thames and unload direct into the refinery. This is how the raw sugar arrives on the banks of the Thames. It's just loose in the holds of this ship. This is the Doxa, and she's come from Jamaica. And she carried originally 24,000 tonnes of raw sugar. And it's picked out of the holds, look, with a grab, chunk by chunk, until they've taken all 24,000 tonnes. It's going to take five days to unload the whole ship. And the grab goes over and tips the whole lot into that hopper. And from the hopper, it goes down onto this conveyor belt, and here you see the raw sugar going straight into the factory to be refined. This is their sugar mountain. This place holds nearly 70,000 tonnes of raw sugar, and at the moment there's, well, maybe nearly 20,000 tonnes in there. Henry Tate made a pile of money out of sugar, and he used it to found a National Gallery of British Art, which was actually his own contemporary collection. He put it in a new building on the site of an old prison on Millbank, and it's now called the Tate Gallery. Everything changed when containers came along, because the container ships were so massive, they simply couldn't fit in the docks upstream. So the whole port effectively moved downstream to Tilbury and Gravesend. Meanwhile, old warehouses have been revamped and turned into posh apartments. The docks have become marinas, and Canary Wharf, which is where we used to unload fruit and veg from the Canary Islands, is now nothing to do with that anymore. It's become the home of high finance and banks. <laughs> 